just about time, I think. So um, we'll say uh, hello and uh, a very warm welcome to our online lecture uh, on uh, personalised audio for television. Um, it's presented jointly by the UK section of the Audio Engineering Society and the Institute of Engineering Technology. Um, just a few words about the two organisations, in case you don't know of them. Uh, the AES is the only professional body worldwide dedicated exclusively to audio technology, very much an international organisation with over 12,000 members worldwide uh, and a, a very diverse mix of members, engineers, creative artists, scientists, students, all working together in all sorts of different audio disciplines. Uh, one thing you may not know is that the AES membership does entitle you to full access to the online library of journals, research papers, uh, conference proceedings and technical standards. All that stuff is available in your membership. It's included. Uh, so it's a very powerful resource for any audio engineer. Um, we're delighted to welcome colleagues from the IET today, also very much a global organisation with an impressive, I think it's about 154,000 members in 148 countries worldwide, um, produces, of course, a rich mix of world class publications and technical standards, organises about 1,500 events annually. And of course, provides engineering leadership and education leadership, including routes to formal professional registration as a chartered engineer. So as it calls itself, it truly is a home for engineering and technology professionals worldwide in all walks of industry and academia. Um, so uh, about tonight's talk, uh, a little bit of admin. Um, it is being recorded and it will be available in due course on the AES YouTube web pages. Um, we will be taking questions, of course, as always, very much welcomed. Um, please put those in the Q&A window in Zoom and not in the chat area. Keep the chat for chat, by all means use that. But if you have specific questions you want me to direct to our presenter today, uh, then please use the Q&A provided. Um, we're not planning on jumping out into a separate room for the after talk question and answers and discussion. Um, we'll try and make that work and avoid the jump, which tends to uh, be a bit inconvenient and we often lose people. Uh, so we'll take questions in the order in which they're received at the end of Rupert's talk. Um, which leads me happily to report that our speaker today is uh, a member of both the IET and the Audio Engineering Society like me. Um, I began my own engineering career many years ago at the BBC in London, and one of the first places I was posted after Evesham Training College was the famous Made of Ale recording studios, where uh, I was fortunate to meet Rupert and work a little bit with him. Um, he was known uh, as a, an affable and very knowledgeable guy, of course still is, and therefore was a tremendous mentor. Um, but I hope you'll forgive me for mentioning that he was also famous in, in the engineering team for a specific incident involving a soldering iron. Um, he was working close up on a PCB, soldering something slipped, uh, and the iron went up his nose and caused some burns. Um, his singed nostrils, fortunately, I believe, weren't too serious, but it did require an entry in the accident book. And that's what he's famous for, because he drew a little diagram in the column where it says, how would you prevent this accident from happening again? He drew a lovely little diagram of a nose guard to be worn whilst soldering. And uh, it was great fun for everybody. But I think the management didn't quite see it that way. However, they must have forgiven him because he shortly afterwards did become senior engineer at the Maida Vale Studios and the famous Radiophonic Workshop. Um, he later received the Gold Award from BBC Radio in 2015 and now has over 40 years experience in audio engineering, broadcasting and is pioneering work pioneering work with audio objects, which allow the viewer to alter the relative loudness of dialogue and background, won the NAB's Innovation Award in 2011. He's based in Whitstable, uh, now a freelance consultant to broadcasters covering topics from acoustics to broadcast resilience. Um, he's spoken at many AES and EBU events and represents a number of equipment manufacturers in the UK. And presently, as I'm sure we're about to hear, he's working with the Fraunhofer Institute on audio for next generation television. Um, so without any further ado, Rupert, a great pleasure to have you here um, in our lecture this evening and uh, please go ahead. 
Well, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. And before I uh, share my presentation, uh, I just want to say, yes, it is entirely true. I did stick the soldering <laughs> iron up my nose um, and, and put a little diagram of, of how that kind of accident could be avoided. And in those days, there's something like seven copies of accident report forms to be filled in by hand. And the management sent them all back and told me not to be facetious and do it all again, <laughs> which was a shame because it would have worked. Anyway, um, yeah, welcome and thank you for very much, very much indeed for that wonderful introduction. And I will forgive you for mentioning my my uh, experiment with with uh, wearing soldering irons nasally. Um, I mean, who knows? Maybe soldering irons that can be shoved up in your nose are what people want. Uh, right. So let's um, let's get straight into it. And a quick F five. Uh, Quick F5. There we go. Right. Is that working? Wonderful. Yep. Good. We're good to go. Okay. So I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about who I am. Um, perhaps not quite so formal as the wonderful introduction I've just been given. Uh, I outline why personalized audio is important and necessary these days. Um, then explain a bit about the audio objects that can deliver it and how they can be used in television. Then I'll talk a bit about how they can be created, how they can be consumed, and give some examples from the real world, because this isn't just a laboratory technology. And then we'll do questions and answers at the end. So off we go. So Rupert Brunn, uh, I started my career as a television camera operator. This, this photo shows me much more recently. I was 19 when I started doing this. Um, and it took the BBC uh, nearly two years to sack me for incompetence, which was amazing, really, because it was blindingly obvious for, to everybody, including me, from the first day of the first training course, that I was never going to be able to operate a television camera. There wasn't one aspect of that job I could do. But whilst I was working my notice, I did get a job at uh, the, the Maid of L Studios and the job was basically um, making the tea and carrying the toolbox for the engineer um, but it turned out that I was breathtakingly good at carrying toolboxes and making tea so I did end up uh, uh, as the head of technology for radio and music at the BBC. Radio and music sounds like a hot, an odd title. What it meant was that I was responsible for all technology for the national radio stations and the bits of television where the sound really matters, uh, like the music programmes. Um, and then I, I resigned eight years ago. I didn't fall out with anybody or anything. I just realised I was in danger of spending the last 10 years of my career doing things I'd done before, but the BBC were going to give me less money to do them this time round. So I went freelance in order to explore the whole world outside, uh, which was terrifying because I'd been completely institutionalised after 35 years in the BBC and had no idea how the whole freelance thing works. And I'm not sure I have now, but it's going OK so far. Uh, what else do I do? I'm not doing audio engineering. Uh, I love going for walks with my wife and the dogs. Uh, I, I love analogue photography. I, I know it's old fashioned and black and white film and everything, but I spend all my working life with, with the latest high tech. So it's nice to go back to something simple um, and my old motorbike. So that's what I do when I'm not doing this. So objects. Objects come in many types. And before I go on to talk about the specific audio object type, let's just set the context a bit with a bit of framework around other types. So there's two basic categories of objects. There's layers and the segments. Layers are things you turn on and off whilst you're consuming the content. And, and we already have these. Subtitles are a data object that is basically a layer. You can turn it off and overlay it on top of what you're watching. Audio, audio description is, is uh, a layer which you can turn on and off and hear in addition to the main program content. So objects aren't entirely new. I think what, what's new is, is calling them that. Um, and the other type are segments. The most simple example of a segment that I could think of is when you watch uh, a program from a series on one of the streaming services, it, it often says there's, there's a recap of previous episodes and you can choose to watch that or miss it. Um, so that is a segment that is an object which you can consume or not. However, it can be far more sophisticated than that. Um, the BBC have done a lot of work under the story former 
project, um, which allows them to create content which can adapt its length according to the amount of time you have and how interested you are in the subject. So you can have the program the right length for your commute, or if you're really interested, you can dive right down into it. And it's very clever that it can add or remove chapters from the program in a way that means that the narrative flow is still coherent, um, uh, whatever length you listen to it. But I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about audio objects with a focus on personalization. So why do we need personalized audio? Uh, well, one good reason is because it's really good fun to work on. Um, but also because, well, let, let me take you back to that uh, experiment that was mentioned in the introduction back in 2011. Um, I went and visited Fraunhofer in, in uh, their headquarters near Nuremberg in Germany, and they were experimenting with spatial audio objects. And they allowed the consumer to do their own mix of the content. And Fraunhofer's idea was that um, content creators could send, uh, for example, a rock concert to the consumer and the consumer could decide how much bass guitar they wanted and how much vocals and whether they, they didn't actually want any drums at all and, and put, put the lead guitar over there. Um, and uh, I wasn't very keen on that because I thought, well, the record companies and artists will never let us do it. And it's a bit niche. Um, and it's not really the problem we're trying to solve. However, if we could use this technology to let the consumer turn the dialogue up and the background sounds down or vice versa, then that would tackle the thing that the broadcasters receive more complaints on than anything else. Uh, and Fraunhofer thought that wasn't very exciting, although it was valid. But they agreed to give it a try because I pointed out that if we did it from Wimbledon during the tennis championships, I promised we'd get a lot of publicity out of it. And I picked that because it's one of the few sports where you actually hear a great deal of the actual sport as well as the sound of, of the court and the commentary. You know, you, you get the, the ball hits, you get the baseline grunting. So there was a simple web based user interface which was devised. Um, you had to download it as a plugin to your web browser back in those days. Um, and it gave you a volume control and a slider that let you set the um, the mix to zero in the middle, which was the default, default broadcast mix. Or you could boost the commentary and cut the background court sounds or the other way around. So a very, very simple user control. And it received huge, huge public um, uh, and, and press coverage, um, partly because a couple of the tennis players that year were really loud grunters. And so the, the press picked up on it as the grunt controller. You could turn the grunting down, um, which is a bit of a shame, given that it was a serious experiment into to use of audio objects to improve accessibility. But hey, publicity is good publicity, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, I don't remember any of the people in this picture being around when we were rigging the cables through the, the various underground tunnels of, of Wimbledon. But hey, they got in the pictures. I didn't. So when we'd done it, we, we had a survey to ask people what they thought of it. Now, I have to say at the outset that, that there were about 50 people completed this survey and they were self-selecting and they were the kind of people who were prepared to download a plug into their web browser and they did it because they wanted to experiment. So I'm not claiming by any means that this is representative of the average user or normal use. But what was interesting was that of this self-selecting group who, who did this and completed the survey, about 45% of them wanted more commentary and less grunting. And another 45% uh, wanted it the other way around. And about 5% uh, liked it in the middle and 5% didn't care. Which proved the hypothesis I'd had at the outset, which is that one balance doesn't work for everybody in all situations. So why might that be? And why do we need to personalize the audio? We've got away without doing it for decades after all. Well, one thing is presbycusis. So that's a fancy term for the fact that as we get older, we find it harder to understand uh, speech 
in the presence of other sounds. And this is something that happens to all of us as we age. We find if we're in a, a noisy environment and there's a lot of chatter going on, we find it harder to understand what the person sitting next to us is saying. Um, it can affect us from quite an early age, uh, but it gets everybody to some extent eventually. And um, according to the Royal National Institute for the Deaf, there are about 12 million people in the UK with some form of hearing loss. So it's not a, a small minority who struggle with this. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm seeing increasing reports of even teenagers having the subtitles turned on on the television. Um, and then there's the diverged experiences. So in the good old days, we all watched television, gathered round a, a, a large box in, the, in a nice quiet living room um, with the parents and the children and the dog. Um, and the nice large box had at least one decent loudspeaker facing you. Nowadays, televisions are very thin. Um, the, the, for, I don't understand why, but apparently if they're more than a few millimetres thick, people won't buy them. Um, and you can't have a bezel around the edge of the screen, which means that the speakers are very, very small and they're facing down or facing backwards. Um, and with the less expensive television, certainly, even if you have good hearing, it can be really quite difficult sometimes to understand what's being said um people listen on mobile devices all the time earbuds on the underground um people listen whilst they're doing other things they, they have the television on while they're cooking the dinner um at the other end of the extreme people have fabulous fabulous home cinema systems um so one sound balance really doesn't work for everyone in every setting because if the broadcasters were to send the audio with enough dialogue prominence for everybody to be able to stand, understand every word on, on every device in every setting, then those sitting in a good listening environment with decent home cinema systems would have a very, very unsatisfactory sound balance. It would probably be very, very shouty and, and the dialogue far too heavy, and they wouldn't get that immersive, wonderful experience that they paid all that money for. So we have to uh, because of the, the aging population and presbycuses and because of the hugely divergent ways we consume media now, um, I, I firmly believe that we have to make the sound different for different people in different settings. And we can create new audience experiences. This isn't just about accessibility. So on this um, NASCAR racing uh, experiment we did, um, you could listen to the radio dialogue on one of the team radios between the driver and the pit. Um, that raises a lot of uh, editorial questions around compliance, but yep, we did it. Um, or you could have the stadium announcer rather than the ordinary commentator. There are lots of different creative things we could do with this. If you're watching a football match, you could let the crowd decide whether they want to sit with the home crowd or the away crowd. Um, because obviously, if you are watching a Liverpool versus Chelsea match and Chelsea score, hypothetical, they never would. But if they did, you don't want to hear cheering when the opposing team score. So there's all sorts of things this can be used for, as well as um, uh, the, the uh, accessibility issues. So what are these audio objects and how can they help? So you're all familiar, I'm sure, with channels. We create the content for a specific replay environment, stereo or 5.1 or binaural, and we create it for that and we distribute it in that format, uh, fully mixed. And, and up mixing and down mixing are possible but they all have drawbacks. And I'm sure we've all experienced some of the problems that that can create. Um, and with the hugely divergent range of listening environments that I mentioned, those problems get bigger and bigger when you've got everything from uh, a, a mono experience to 7.1 and four height speakers uh, for people to consume it on. With audio objects, we don't necessarily mix everything before we send it. We send the essence, that's the audio, and some metadata. And the metadata tell the consumer device how to mix the content. Um, we call it rendering. So the metadata will describe exactly what the consumer object should do, consumer device should do with that object, 
Um, and it's up to the consumer device to work out how best to do that, given the replay environment it has. If you, you have earbuds plugged in, it should render it to binaural. Um, if you have a home cinema system, it should use all of that. Um, MPEG-H audio also supports scenes, which are a high order ambisonic. So, so it can do channels, objects, and high order ambisonics. Um, that's less used. In fact, I don't think it's currently used at all in a broadcast environment, but there's huge opportunities for it in, in virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, but I'm not gonna cover that. I'm focusing on what you get on your television in this talk. So what do the metadata do? They describe the objects. So uh, is this object, and, and an object can be mono or it can be multi-channel, is it speech or is it music or is it effects? Um, what language is it in? Because you can send multiple languages. How loud should this object be in the mix? Where in space should it be? Is it bang central? Is it behind your right shoulder? Is it over there on the left? Um, and also a bit more sophisticated than that, how diffuse is this object? Is it a point source or is it something that spreads out in space? Um, and the metadata also define presets. These are important because you can't expect your average consumer to be to want to be presented with a whole uh, screen full of controls for them to fiddle with. They may just want a preset that says, I want the standard mix or I want the dialogue boost one or I want audio description and maybe or I want it in French. Um, so the presets are all defined. And the metadata very importantly decide what define what the consumer can do with the objects. Um, because one of the, the things that content creators always raise when I talk to them about uh, next generation audio and audio objects is that they don't want people messing around with their carefully crafted sound balance. They want to be in control of what the consumer hears. The entire inter artistic intention has to be preserved. And I do understand that completely. Um, although I think sometimes content creators have a slightly um, inflated idea of how much control they have over what the audience are hearing. Uh, I, I have been to a house where they bought a surround sound system and unpacked it and thought, oh, five speakers, we'll put three in the living room and two in the kitchen and then wondered why they didn't get any dialogue in the kitchen. Um, so it's really important that the metadata, which are transmitted frame by frame, live with the audio, um, determine what personalization the consumer can do over what range on a frame by frame basis. So uh, it will say whether you're allowed to turn the dialogue up and the background sounds down, and if so, by how much. It will say whether you're allowed to pan the audio description round to one side of the room or up or down. So it's really important that the content creator does remain in control of how much the consumer is allowed to mess with their mix. So uh, within TV, what are they good for? Um, there are production benefits, you know, I've mentioned consumer benefits, but there are huge benefits for producers of content and distributors of content. One of them is reversioning. So imagine that you needed to uh, reversion a program you'd made, uh, perhaps because the, you'd received thousands of complaints because the dialogue wasn't loud enough. Um, at the moment, to do that, you probably have to go back to the original digital audio workstation production audio with hundreds of tracks and an enormous amount of complexity. And if the person who did the original mix isn't available, somebody else has got to try and get their head around how it was done and what's going on and remix every piece of dialogue and every piece of background to make the dialogue more prominent. If you've worked with audio objects um, and you've created it all in a digital audio workstation, but you've then saved uh, music effects and dialogue as separate stems because you've got to transmit them like that all the way through the distribution process, then it's comparatively straightforward to produce a new version where all the dialogue's louder and everything else is quieter. 
or if you wanted to produce a version in a different language, all the dialogue is available to you as a separate stem. You don't necessarily have to go back to the complexities of the original project. You also get creative freedom. What I mean by that is that at the moment, the mix that you create has to be a compromise because you do have to think about the huge range of, of ways in which people are consuming your content and the huge variety of their, their hearing ability. And you perhaps can't create the mix you really like to because there would be a lot of complaints from people saying they couldn't hear the dialogue or they didn't like this or they didn't like that or they wanted something else and you have to compromise. That will always be the case. But if you can give people some choice over how the mix is put together, that actually gives you the freedom to create the default mix the way you think it really should be. Then we get create once use many. I've mentioned that, that the, the content is mixed, we call it rendering, by the consumer device. So you don't have to produce a 5.1 version and a stereo version and a binaural version and a 7.1 plus 4 height version. You produce one version um, and the consumer device knows what its replay capabilities are and renders to that. Um, so that is a huge benefit. Um, you can produce versions with five different languages in them and it's all sitting in one file and, and the consumer can decide which language they want. Um, and finally, reduced bandwidth. So when we're distributing content, uh, particularly if we're broadcasting it, bandwidth is a big issue. Um, now, if you imagine if you wanted to produce some content um, with 5.1 uh, bed to it, and two different languages of commentary, what very often happens is that one language is produced with the 5.1, perhaps the one that, that most of your audience will want, and the other language is just low bandwidth with stereo because you haven't got the broadcast bandwidth to do two 5.1 versions. With audio objects, you can, you can uh, distribute your 5.1 immersive mix and then two objects in different languages, which they're just speech, they can be comparatively low bit rate mono. So instead of two lots of 5.1 to distribute, you've got one lot of 5.1 and two comparatively low bandwidth mono dialogue objects. So you can end up with reduced bandwidth requirements for distribution. And the consumer benefits are things uh, accessibility. So you can turn the dialogue up and down. You can turn the audio description on and off. You can pan the audio description around the room to the player speaker nearest where the person who needs it is sitting. Um, you can choose different languages and you can have more audio choices. As I was mentioning, you can decide which team you want to sit with. I'm sure there are huge numbers of creative possibilities for this. Um, I'm very much an engineer. Uh, not somebody who creates content. Um, we need to get this technology into the hands of more very creative content creators. And then I'm sure they will think of a lot of clever ways to use this that I would never dream of. And also immersion. Um, uh, th this technology can deliver very immersive audio. Uh, either binaural or on multi-speaker systems or on those clever new sound bars that throw sound around the room. And one of the things you can do is you can decide how much Im immersion you want as a consumer. Do I want a very, very immersive mix or do I want one that's less so? And I'll come on to an example of that later. So here's the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, we've done this a couple of times and we did it uh, live. It wasn't broadcast but we did it live and we streamed it to interested parties including the European Broadcasting Union and during what they call the postcards which are the the bits between the performances where they tell you about the artists and the song and the country um, we offered a choice of languages um, you could have the normal mix you could have a dialogue boosted mix or you could have one sans commentaire it says because we're, we're looking at the French version so no commentary so the simple menu would just offer you a choice of those three things. But then if you open up the advanced menu, you can decide how prominent your, your dialogue should be and where you want it, uh, left and right and up and down. All of these menu options, all of the words are included in the audio data stream. They're not 
preset and built into the standard or built into the consumer device. The broadcaster can change any of these at any time. So you could choose your language, you could choose your dialogue level. Uh, now, I don't have a picture to go with this, but during the performance, obviously, that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to decide how prominent you want the dialogue to be or what language you want it to be in They're, they're, they're singing. Um, so what we offered was a choice of different mixes. So you could have broadcast stereo or broadcast 5.1, which were exactly what you would have heard using traditional technology. Or you could have an in the crowd mix, which was really immersive. It stuck you halfway back in the crowd and you got the sound of the crowd all around you, um, which and, and it had height to it. And it really was the sound of being in the crowd at the venue, which I really love. But it wouldn't suit everybody. You know, some people just want a nice, clear performance of the song. So we can give them the choice. So all that's fine. How are they made? Um, there's different ways of doing it. There's the soft, the hard and open ways of creating audio objects. So let's start with pre-recorded content, which you will probably be making in a digital audio workstation. So there's an MPEG-H authoring suite, which if you're going to do, there are other types of uh, audio objects I should have said. There's, there's some from Dolby and uh, there's some from DTS. Um, I'm talking about MPEG-H because I just, that's the one I work with all the time and it's the one I know. But the, they, they will all mostly do the same thing. There's a few differences which have come from the fact that the MPEG-H started off as uh, a, an audio object for live broadcast thing as where the others started off as a cinema thing and grew from that so they're, they're slightly different in the way they do things but with mpeg h there's an authoring suite it's standalone software that looks a bit like this so you create your content in a digital audio workstation you you perhaps mix your bed and you've got some languages of commentary which you've you've mixed and put your processing on and then you import those into this authoring software. And that lets you define that the languages, for example, are a switch group. The consumer can choose which one they want. They don't get all three languages at the same time. Uh, you can decide where in space that is going to be rendered to. Um, and you can define the interactivity settings. So you see at the bottom of that screen, you, you've got interactivity settings and you can determine uh, how much gain control, how much you can pan azimuth, how much you can pan elevation as a consumer, and you can set those limits. And uh, this is available free from the Fraunhofer website. You do have to register and send them your email address and they'll then send you a link to download it. Um, you can also use plugins on your favorite digital audio workstation. And there is now support for this MPEG-H authoring in many, many digital audio workstations, including Pro Tools and Nuendo. And you can export from video production software. Um, so DaVinci Resolve, for example, you, if you look in the menus, you will find that you can export with MPEG-H audio if you want to. So that's the software approach. It's quite well developed. Um, and third parties are now starting to do this. So uh, Salsa Sound have MixAir, which is their artificial intelligence automated mixing system, which can do all sorts of clever things, particularly for sports matches, ball kicks. Um, and that can now output MPEG-H production format audio. Um, and what I really like about this one is it provides a very simple user interface. If you get a five minute demonstration of how it works, you could do it uh, as where the Fraunhofer stuff. I mean, it, it really does work. It's brilliant, but you do have to read the instructions. Um, this one uh, is very, very straightforward. Um, and and uh, we will, I will make sure these links all get circulated after the after the event. For live content, though, you're not going to be doing it in a digital audio workstation. You're going to need um, to be able to do this in real time. So there are standalone authoring units which you plug into your video chain. Um, the audio goes into them. You uh, do your MPEG H authoring. You define whether things are speech or music and what language they are and whether they're switch groups and what the consumer can do with them. And then they come out the other side. Uh, as as the MPEG H authoring format, um, which has the audio and the metadata all included in it. 
Um, we can work with IP, but one important thing was that a lot of television is still produced using 16 channel SDI. So we had to come up with a way of enabling broadcasters with that infrastructure to work with these audio objects. So we did that. Um, SDI has a 16 channel limit, which might sound like a really serious limitation, but, but 5.1 5 plus four bed is, is 10. So three languages takes that up to 13. Audio description takes that to 14. And you've got something else you can do that takes 15. Channel 16 contains the metadata encoded as uh, frequency shift keyed audio. It sounds just like old fashioned time code. Anybody who's heard the old fashioned linear time code will recognize the kind of sound immediately. Um, it's very, very robust. You can pump it through your mixing desk. You can ETU it, you can compress it, you know, within reason. Um, and this is a really important point is that all the metadata are carried in the audio stream along with the audio. None of it has to be put anywhere else. None of it's in the transport stream. And that's important because if you want the consumer to, to experience things where the options change with frame accuracy, you have to have all of that in the audio stream, not somewhere else. So. How might we put it all together? We start to get some diagrams. So in this diagram, I've shown that we've got two venues with SDI video with the 16 channels of audio in it, going into AMUs, that's the authoring and monitoring unit. Those are the hardware boxes that let you define uh, your, your objects and what the consumer can do with them. Um, and you can use them for monitoring what you've created. And from there, it goes into your video switcher and as well as the two venues, we've got some legacy content from a playout system or from the ad server. And because the metadata are all carried in the audio stream and are synchronous with the video frame boundaries, you can switch on any uh, video frame boundary and the audio won't glitch and it will instantly adjust to whatever format of audio you've got coming in. You can use cloud services if you want to, to package it up and distribute it, and it goes off to the audience. So, uh, yeah, seamless changes between two programs um, at any video frame, as I said, it's really important that you can do that. You, you don't want the audio to mute or glitch if you switch from uh, audio objects in 5.1 to legacy stereo. You don't want the audio to mute or glitch if the content creator makes a big change to the personalization that the consumer is allowed to do. Um, and that's really, really important. And also because uh, personalized insertion of advertisements is, is very much a big topic in the broadcast world at the moment. And if you want to insert adverts into your stream, um, perhaps even on the client side, then uh, you need to be able to do sample accurate audio switching. So that's all fine. We've got MPEG-H and Dolby and DTS, and they all do this stuff uh, with different strengths and weaknesses. But broadcasters want uh, to, to adopt a more open standard. They don't really want to be putting any of these things into their archive and, and needing to replay them in 70 years time. So we have the audio definition model and serial ADM. Uh, there's some nice reference numbers there. I know many of you like a good standard and so do I. Um, now, the good thing about the audio definition model is that it's a very comprehensive way of providing metadata that tell you everything you need to know about audio, including audio objects. Um, it was very forward thinking. Um, and it does that extremely well. The problem is that because it, it caters for every possible use case and, and um, every possible piece of metadata you might need to put with your audio, it's very comprehensive, which makes it really hard to implement and test in its totality. And that has impeded its adoption to some extent. So what do we do about it? We have profiles. So we say for broadcasting, um, you only need this subset of the audio definition model and that will meet your needs and you can use that. 
Um, these are not necessarily the most brilliant thing because all of a sudden you've got two versions of the standard. You've got the full one, full fat, and you've got reduced fat ADM shrunk uh, for your specific needs. But it's a very practical way of getting around the problem. Um, and David Marston at the BBC coined the term squeezer for something which will convert one profile to another. So you might create your audio object content using a production profile, which will let you have lots and lots of objects. And then when you come to distribute it to your consumer, you need to squash it down to a smaller number of objects. Um, and he came up with the concept of the squeezer that would do this for you. Um, ADM can also be used as a format converter because different companies are now starting to uh, adopt it. And I've done this myself. Uh, I can take a bit of content that's been created using Dolby Atmos and export it to ADM and then import that into MPEG-H. And all of a sudden I've got an MPEG-H version of something that started out as a Dolby Atmos version. So it's it's kind of a bit like plain text format, you know, you can use it to, to convert from one thing to another. There are limitations on that because the different systems have different capabilities, but it does work. Um, uh, but that's a file-based format. And for live content, we need serial ADM. Um, and the BBC have recently done uh, good old Dave Marston again, who seems to be very much the person driving ADM. Um, he, he's recently done an experiment with Eurovision Song Contest where uh, he set up a production train that used serial ADM and then uh, a, a squeezer at the end to output production format, so, sorry, distribution con format content. So that's all a bit, a lot to take in. Let's have a diagram. So we've got uh, a remote production and coming out of the remote production, we've got audio and we've got video. Video is not important. We all know that. So you just stick that into your emission coder to send it to the audience and you stick it in your archives. Don't have to do anything else with that. Um, you have a sound mixer, which creates your immersive mix. And that might output serial ADM. Um, and then you have a hardware box, an authoring monitoring unit to add your personalization. And that outputs serial ADM, which goes off to your archive to join the video. Um, and again, because you've done that, you've got uh, the possibility of, of easier repurposing at some time in the future, should you need to do it. And that's what's in your archive. And the serial ADM also goes to the squeezer to be converted to an emission profile, which has fewer objects and less complexity so that your consumer device can understand it. You then might have another authoring and monitoring unit so that you can uh, monitor and quality control and get your unit to replay it to you in binaural and mono and stereo and all the other formats so you can make sure you like the way it sounds. Um, and then that goes into an emission coder along with the video and you get your uh, IP or broadcast stream out of it. I and mean, we can do this for terrestrial television, satellite television or, or delivery over IP. Um, it all works. It doesn't have to be done that way. Uh, as I said, we can create content over um, 16 channel SDI and embed the metadata in one of the audio channels. And there are quite a number of broadcast um, coders that understand that. So you can just check, stick your 16 channel audio SDI into it and it will take in the 15 channels of audio and the one channel of time code like metadata and it will know exactly how to code that up for distribution. It's, it's a very real thing. It's not just a laboratory thing. The serial ADM bit is still laboratory. People are working on it, starting to be implemented in the real world, but there's a little way to go with that. Um, but if you can do without serial ADM and stick with one manufacturer's proprietary solution, then end-to-end -end is, is perfectly doable. Um, so given that, what's stopping us? Why haven't we all got this? Um, well, some places have. It's been live on the air in South Korea for quite some considerable time. And it's, it's been live on the air in, in Brazil for a while. We, we covered all of the Football World Cup matches for Brazil, and they care about their football, uh, in immersive audio with personalization. So it is real. It's on the air. There's a full end-to-end -end production and consumer chain technology available. But there are some stumbling blocks which are, are making widespread adoption slower. 
Uh, first of all, is it, it requires new workflows. All the changes that have happened to the pictures in television are just more. You know, UHD is just more pixels than HD. Wide color gamma, gamma, wide dynamic range, higher frame rate. They're all the stuff you've always done, but more. So you might have to buy some more equipment, but you don't have to change the way you work at all. To work with next generation audio, as it's called, the audio objects, you've got to work differently because you've got to keep those pieces of audio separate all the way through the production process. Um, there's a lack of backward compatibility. So if a broadcaster broadcasts or streams something with audio objects, your old television is not going to understand it and you won't hear anything. So people have to buy new consumer devices or the broadcasters have to um, provide two versions and then you run into the bandwidth problem. Um, and not all broadcast products yet support it. So as I was saying, there's lots of audio workstations that do. Um, there are many, many tools available that do support it, uh, but not everything does. So, for example, a broadcaster's preferred media asset management system might not yet support it. Now, of course, if you've worked with your audio as 16 channels of SDI, then that will go through your media asset management system with no trouble at all. But the system won't know about the fact that it's objects and what they are and how to use them. They'll just pass through it transparently which makes it difficult to manage. Your archiving system might not understand audio objects. Um, so there are some that do and some that don't, but the one the broadcaster chooses to use might not. Um, and there's the investment cycle. So this sort of big technology is hugely expensive and projects to change from one media asset management system to another are extremely complex, risky, hugely expensive, and so broadcasters don't do it very often. So um, even though there may be a product available to them, which will do all of this, um, they're not going to go through all that pain and cost to add uh, audio objects, beneficial though it is, uh, it has to wait until they are about to replace all that technology anyway. And then hopefully, um, audio object capability will be on the list of things they'll be looking for when they're choosing a replacement. But there is something we can do right now that doesn't rely on new workflows and doesn't even necessarily cause a problem with compatibility. So for legacy content and workflows, there's something we can do. The, we can unmix the audio and MPEG H Dialog Plus does this very well using a machine learning algorithm. Um, there are many others on the market too. Um, what this does is you feed your legacy audio into it, the fully mixed stereo or 5.1 content, and it unmixes the speech from everything else. It can't do it perfectly, but given that you are actually going to mix these two things back together again, but perhaps just with a slightly different um, ratio of speech to background, uh, most of the artifacts disappear when you mix it back together again. So you can, you can unmix your legacy content. You don't have to change your workflows. You just make it the way you always have. And then at the last minute before it goes out of the door, you unmix it and you can then create different versions with different mixes of dialogue to background. And there are broadcasters in, in Europe that are actually doing this. So you can either unmix your audio and then create MPEG H audio stream with um, different content in it, or you can remix them into a legacy version but have two of them. So the consumer can pick up a legacy broadcast with the default audio mix or a legacy broadcast with more dialogue. Um, and this is happening. Broadcasters are doing it. And 80% um, of those who, who participated in an experiment liked being able to do that. 46% uh, liked the dialogue boosted version better. 21% um, liked the original one and 32% didn't care. So that's a real thing that can happen today. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily involve audio objects, as I say, because you might take in legacy format and 
uh, transmit legacy format, but it gets you one of the principal benefits, gets you uh, on the road. Um, there is a paper on this in the AES library that was mentioned earlier, and all of those of you who are members can get to this stuff without paying anything, which is brilliant, and I will share the link afterwards. So how can these things be consumed? Uh, they can be multi-platform, broadcast, or IP, and they are. And all those things are live on the air right now. So in the home, many, many televisions support audio objects. So I mentioned it's been on the air in South Korea for some years now, and that's great. Um, but the late and and Samsung and LG televisions are made there. So, hey, they've got to support it. Um, the fact that it's now been adopted in Brazil means everybody else is going to have to adopt it too. Um and uh, soundbars can do it. On the move, a smartphone, even one two generations old, is perfectly capable of streaming, decoding um, MPEG H audio and 4K video. So it can be done on the move. You can build an app that will give the consumer the controls and the decode can be done in software. There's a soundbar trick. So this one wasn't obvious to many people, but if you're consuming, personalized audio on your television, although the audio is coming out of your AV amp or your sound bar or your television, you don't want to use another remote control. You want to use the screen of the television to do it. Now, if you're using a sound bar or an AV amp, the obvious way to do that would be for the TV, because you want to use the TV screen and remote control to set which option you want, the TV to decode your audio, remix it according to the personalization you've asked for, and then send that down the wire to your, your AV amp or soundbar. But there's a much better way of doing it. So what happens with MPEG-H is when you use your television to choose the personalization you want, it just writes some extra metadata into the audio stream. That goes down the H HDMI cable to the soundbar or AV amp, and that then decodes it, taking into account the broadcast metadata and your personalization data. So the, the audio doesn't have to be decoded, recoded in the television. Everything stays in sync and life is wonderful. So in the real world, as I say, it's, it's live on the air in South Korea and Brazil. There have been lots of experiments, European athletics championships, football World Cup, NASCAR racing, uh, more recent World Cup, which was live on the air rather than just an experiment. And it's not just broadcast. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 360 reality audio from Sony Music. And uh, these services all use MPEG-H. It doesn't necessarily say so in the app, but that's what's under the bonnet. So in summary, uh, one sound balance no longer in my view works for everyone on every device. Audio objects allow efficient production and delivery of personalized audio. Accessibility is the primary use case, not immersion and all that fancy stuff. Um, and it's already in use 24 seven in some territories. So that brings me to the end. And I wonder whether there are any questions. Oh, it's all gone Thank you very much indeed, Rupert. That was absolutely wonderfully clear. Um, I started out when I first heard this topic of the talk wondering what, what personalised audio for television and had some kind of idea of a red button or something, but no more than that. Um, that's been wonderfully, wonderfully clear and extremely interesting. And I'm sure um, everybody in the audience will, will agree with that. Um, how do you want to handle the questions? We, we have four in the Q&A bar so far, which I don't know whether you can see. Um, if you want to address those directly, by all means do, or I can read them out. Um, maybe it's better I read them out just in case. Um, I don't know whether they meet, they get to the YouTube platform or not, or one of us reads them out at least. Yeah, I can I can do that if you like. Okay. So, uh, I'll Alex leave Wood's been very prolific with questions. Um, Alex Wood says, what's actually different about like, how they treat music TV and non-music TV? Well, as I mentioned, you, you can offer a different level of immersion. But yes, there's no doubt that, that the primary use cases for this would be non-music content because um, you're not going to have dialogue to turn up and down necessarily in, in music. Or I suppose with opera, you might. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, we can offer different levels of immersion, depending on whether you want to hear something like the recording studio would give you or something like being in the middle of the hall and you can choose between them. Uh, so 50 people completed the NetMix survey. How many? I honestly can't remember um, how many completed the how many downloaded the plugin for the NetMix experiment. It, it, it was over it was 13 years ago, 12 years ago. Can't remember. It, it was hundreds, not thousands. Um, so did NetMix get much publicity outside the UK? That's a very, very good point. Um, no, it didn't, uh, because for rights reasons, we were only able to stream the uh, tennis coverage in the UK. We didn't have rights to stream it anywhere else. So it was GOIP locked to the UK. Now, of course, the blogs and all the information could be read by anybody anywhere, but only people in the UK were able to try it. Uh, so... Uh, Jamie Angus, hi, 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 Jamie. Uh, oops, it's just scrolled up with something. Um, is reduced bandwidth really an issue? Um, it is for broadcast, obviously not for IP because they're the bandwidth. You know, each person is consuming what they're consuming, but for broadcast, being able to reduce the bandwidth um, and not have to transmit lots of five point one beds just to offer different languages is a big uh, benefit. Uh, yeah, he's so uh, uh, Philip Jackson. I appreciate the quip about video's lack of importance relative to audio, but I work with video vision folk and I want to ask about object based video. And uh, yeah, so absolutely, object based video is also important. Um, and there's not much happening yet, as you rightly say. Um, but I am a member of uh, the DVB, the standard setting body are starting to look at object-based media and there is a DVB working group looking at that right now. So the standards bodies are starting to take an interest in object-based media as a whole, including video. Because you're absolutely right, it is important. It's just that we haven't quite got very far. We're working it out yet. Um, Is there a roadmap for MPEG-H and general NTA supporting consumer streaming platforms? Now, this is another very good question. Thank you, Alex Begman. Um, there's a lot of work going on. There are a lot of discussions. I think what we really need is for NGA uh, audio objects to be handled natively in web browsers. That would be a huge breakthrough. Um, but obviously that kind of standardization takes a long time and a lot of discussion and the web web browser uh, providers have to be really convinced of the value of doing it. And it hasn't happened yet. Uh, I have done some experiments and I've worked with people who've done some experiments who, and we have proved that it's perfectly possible to decode object-based audio in a web browser without it putting a huge overhead on the computer to do it, uh, but it's not uh, adopted yet. Um, so I presume sometime we can make speech louder than background music on TV and films. Yeah, I, it, it's absolutely doable. As I said, we can, uh, if you, if a movie is provided in Dolby Atmos, um, we can do it with that. Uh, that's something we can do today. Um, and how does, uh, so Alex Wood says, how did South Korea cope with the barriers you mentioned, such as consumer equipment? Uh, it's very easy. Uh, South Korea is a command economy and an enormous amount of their income is generated by the TV set manufacturers. So they were quite happy to just uh, say, we're going to do this and everybody will have to buy new televisions in order to receive the new service. Um, what does tend to happen is that the new audio goes along with a new picture standard. So, for example, if you uh, if a country introduce UHD uh, high frame rate wide dynamic range pictures, they might introduce um, the, the next generation audio object, audio objects at the same time so that people buy the new television to get the fancy pictures. And, oh, look, we've got the nice sound capability with it. Um, And uh, Alex would also ask, if, if, although it's adopted outside Europe, were the standards and audio object technology all developed in Europe? Um, a lot of it was developed in Europe by Fraunhofer. And uh, early on, the, um, 
the the companies that are now part of DTS were based in Europe, um, in Ireland and other places in Europe. Uh, but of course, DTS are now American and, and Dolby are American. So some of the work's been done in the States. Um, and Bill Walker says, is virtual reality a driver for wider deployment of audio objects? Um, I'm sure it is. Um, and although we can use the same technical standards to do it for virtual reality and games as we do for broadcast, there doesn't seem to be a, very much overlap between the two. The two worlds don't seem to be talking to each other, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, if you can help with that, that'd be great. So uh, Alex Wood says, I asked about South Korea and also what about Brazil? Now, Brazil's an interesting case in point. Thank you, Alex. Very fair point. I skipped that one. Um, Brazil decided that they were going to upgrade their national television service in two stages. Um, they were going to have TV 2.5, which had a lot of backwards compatibility in it, and then TV 3.0, uh, where they would just go for the new system and they would do it in steps. Um, and what they did was they ran a big competition where the different companies who wanted to get the contract to provide the technology had to send a container full of stuff, basically glass to glass, and some instructions. And some people at the university uh, in Brazil uh, put it all together and followed the instructions and tested whether it met all of their use cases. And that was the basis used for the decision on what to go for. What they're doing in Brazil is that they're using it at the moment for some premium, some premium services, and there is simulcasting of, um, of, of traditional services for those who don't yet have this, the latest technology, because in Brazil, the majority of coverage is by satellite. Uh, it's a very big country, so they do it by satellite. And so there's less of a bandwidth constraint than there is in much of Europe where it's terrestrial television that, that predominates. So, Richard Poole, how could head-related transfer technology be integrated here? Um, yes, absolutely it can. So if you consume audio objects on your mobile device and you, you connect your headphones, um, it should render to binaural and the rules by which it does that are entirely up to the consumer device operating system and the app. So there's no reason in principle why you shouldn't be able to load your own HRTF in there and we would use that. Um, hey, so Lisa Miles says, Rupert, what's your preference for Wimbledon commentator or court sounds? Um, so the answer to that is that it depends what I'm doing. Um, if I'm consuming that content whilst I'm cooking the dinner, uh, I want plenty of commentary because I can't really look at the picture all the time. If I am sitting in my comfy chair in front of my nice big television and I'm really focused on the game, I don't really need the commentator to tell me what's happening because I can see it and I just want the experience of being on the court. So even for me, uh, one mix doesn't always suit me. It depends what I'm doing. So thank you, Lisa. It's nice to be asked what I think. Um, Jamie again. Oh, from Richard Paul. Oh no, we've done that one. We've done the HRTF one. Uh, Alex Wood says you said your job at the BBC was head of audio music TV. Was this different between music and non-music TV just to do with audio? No, no. In my job, I was responsible for all of the national radio stations' technology and the technology that was used for music tv in general so the proms later with jewels all of those programs that were uh, music focused i was responsible for the technology that that they used very odd way of dividing things up the bbc is very good at having reorganizations where the pieces get moved around uh into ways that sometimes make more sense than the previous arrangement and sometimes less and anonymous attendee aa uh, do objects have their own microphones generally, or is there a technology like for live ball sounds that extracts from wide mics? OK, so you don't have to have a correlation between objects and microphones. Um, so you might well find that, that the, the objects are things like your 
music or your effects and and they might have lots and lots of different microphones to them and then there'll be commentary which will be lots and lots of um different microphones what we have found is that if you want to add height generally four extra microphones stuck up high in the right place we're pointing in the right direction um are all you need and that seems to be true, whether it's it's um, a, a prom concert from the Royal Albert Hall or the European Athletics Championships. I was surprised, actually, at how universal this stick up for um, four microphones of the right sort high up in the right place um, seems to be for adding height. It doesn't seem to need to be more complex than that. And Liz Morgan. Uh, we can blame you for the top of the pops then. Yeah, well, up until about eight years ago, maybe. Uh, I, I, I left and it's no longer my problem. So you've reached the end of the list. Any more questions? I'll, I'll dive in with just a, a couple, Rupert, if I may, while perhaps other people are conjecturing. Looks like Alex has got one in a moment. Um, my, mine actually followed on from something Alex was asking earlier on, which is uh, about the, the, the rollout of this at the consumer end. Obviously, if you're using a computer-like device, um, it's probably a lot less of an issue because you can download plugins and software and things like that very easily. Um, a lot of us here in, in the UK anyway have um, televisions for quite a long period of time. I speak for myself anyway. You know, ours is probably 10 years old, still working perfectly well. My wife wants to change it. I'm, I'm not sure I do. <laughs> How much of that is an issue um, in the European markets as opposed to Korea, where everybody rushes out and buys the new thing? Um, is that going to be a defining factor uh, in the, you know, in the rollout of this? I, I think it will be, um, because, as I said, there's the, the broadcaster's investment life cycle, but there's also our investment life cycle. Um, there are ways around this, though. Um, for example, uh, very often it is possible to consume some content on your mobile device, on your phone, and sling that onto your television. Now, if you can decode the audio objects and, and have the menus for personalization on your phone, and your phone can do the, the rendering, and then sling that to your television with its surround sound system, then it's possible that you can consume it on your TV without having to buy a new TV. So there are ways around it, but it is absolutely a factor. Um, and of course, a lot of this is down to licensing. There are manufacturers who say that, you know, who support it in the sets they sell in South Korea. But when you buy a set in Europe, it's not there because they've got to pay a few cents extra for the license to include that technology. And if they're going to sell it in Europe where there's no services being broadcast, they don't include it. Having said that, what they say and the reality isn't always quite the same. I put some MPEG H audio objects as files onto a, a USB drive and walked into John Lewis and started plugging it into televisions. And I found quite a lot of them would play um, the audio objects off my files on my pen drive. Although whether they would play them if they were broadcast or streamed is, is a different question. Mm -hmm. I think that probably answers Alex's next question, which was after South Korea and Brazil, who's next? But you might want to take that as a specific point. So, so yes. So who's next? Well, I wish I knew. Obviously, there's a huge amount of work going on, uh, but a lot of that is is commercially confidential and, and I can't uh, say or speculate. All I can do is assure you, is assure you that there is a lot of work going on. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I one of the reasons I left the BBC when I did was because I wanted to work on this and I want to see it implemented. Um, and that is still my goal. And I think I've probably only got about another three years to go till I retire. So I need to get my finger out. I hope it's longer than that for the sake of the, the industry, Rupert. But uh, yeah. Um, I mean, one, one other question from me in case anybody else wants to sort of think about things while I'm talking. Um, to to what extent do you see this ultimately being rolled out? I mean, do, are, are we going to have um, hundreds and hundreds of objects? And presumably there is a bandwidth limit ultimately when you start putting more and more slots into that MPEG-H coding. Um, there are, are only so many you can you can 
deal with, or is that not true? So the the standard itself will cope with a lot, um, but the broadcast profile says that you that the receiver has to be able to receive. I think it's thirty two objects, but only decode sixteen of those simultaneously. Don't quote me on that, but it's something like that. Um, because if you think about it, a lot of it might be different languages that are being offered, and you're only going to decode one of those at a time. Mm -hmm. um so uh, and that's based around uh the processing power of consumer devices and not wanting to burden them with too much um decoding to do um but of course you know by the time this has been widely adopted the processing power of consumer devices will have increased enormously compared with when that profile of the standard was selected for broadcast use is there a limit to the number of slots in terms of the broadcast bandwidth, you know, in the MPEG H stream? Um, so the broadcast bandwidth, um, yeah, so, you know, a typical MPEG H stream that, that if it's you really good quality with lots of immersion and personalization, you're going to be around 384 kilobits a second, somewhere around there. Um, now, on terrestrial television, that would be a challenge um on satellite less so um my personal feeling is that in much of europe uh, audio objects will not be adopted for broadcast it will be something that happens over ip only um i think when the bbc eventually uh do the right thing and start broadcasting uh, mpeg h audio it'll be on the iplayer not not broadcast and there of course bandwidth is much less of an issue Mm. And presumably that's where uh, the squeezer comes in to uh, to remove a load of the options which you would presumably want to preserve for broadcast production purposes, but not send out to the consumer. That's right. What you put in your archive needs to have as much uh, information and content as possible because you never know what you might want to do with it in the future. Perfect. Thank you. There's another question from Alex about smart TVs. Could they be upgraded? So uh, certainly the TVs that I know do have the technology in them is just not been enabled. Um, I, I suspect that they could be upgraded were the manufacturers to choose to do so. But it gets awfully complicated because for everyone that's upgraded, they then have to pay Fraunhofer or Dolby or DTS, depending on which system it was, uh, a small royalty for each television where it was upgraded and enabled. Um, and that gets awfully complicated. And I suspect the television manufacturers might just prefer that you went and bought a new television. <laughs> yeah. Question from John Grant as well. Is bandwidth an issue on a mobile device? Well, 5G will fix all of that, of course. Um, so compared with the pictures, uh, the audio is a small overhead um as i said my my two generations old google pixel phone could cope with with streaming 4k and a full 16 uh, audio objects and decode them um over the 4g network so yeah the, the the audio is a very small overhead do we have any questions if you do it all on your data plan mind you <laughs> The author knows as uh, as a, a book uh, I know quotes <laughs> from personal experience. Do we have any more questions for for Rupert? Are we done? We've had a good, healthy discussion. Certainly, any more for any more before we bring the event to a close? It looks like everybody's done with the questions. So. With that, Rupert, um, on behalf of the AES and the IET, thank you so much for uh, your presentation tonight. It's been absolutely fascinating. It makes me realise, having worked uh, in, indust in industrial electronics for a number of years after my bead days, how things have moved on. Um, and it's certainly, uh, it's, it's certainly opened my eyes to uh, a lot of possibilities for the future. Um, lots of thanks coming up in the chat, quite rightly. Um, I'm just going to borrow from uh, Philip Jackson, actually, who said Super Talk 
um, and uh, lovely, lively Q&A interaction. I think that absolutely sums it up. Thank you, Philip. Um, thank you very much again, Rupert. Thank you to everybody for all their questions um, and for joining us. And I hope uh, you'll you'll join us all for the next AES uh, discussion, which will be in the middle of September, all being well. Um, our thanks again to Rupert and to the back staff at the AES and to all of you for joining us. Thanks again and uh, have a great rest of the day, rest of the evening, wherever you are. Thanks again, thanks, Rupert. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to everybody for the brilliant questions. Um, it's always nice to get a good, good set of questions at the end because it shows you're still here and you're still awake. And I really do appreciate them. Thank you again, Rupert. Lovely to see you. And uh, good night, good day, good afternoon to everybody, uh, wherever you're watching and whenever and wherever. Bye for now.